Hello everyone, welcome to ICU Basic Series 2. My name is Chu Chan Li. Today I'm going to go through Mechanical Ventilation 101. This lecture is to design for people who have no prior experience of mechanical ventilations. I want to spend this time to go through with you what are the common settings and concepts of mechan mechanical ventilations. Um, these are one of the lectures that I want to conduct. Um, in the future, I also will talk about other topics in respiratory failure, including pre-intubation and intubation plan and winning of ventilators. Just like a lot of life support machines that we all use in the intensive care units, the physician have the job to account in patient condition and set up the right settings and right variables to uh, give a clear instruction to the machine so that machine can help the patient in certain ways. So thing to know today is to um, what are the common modes for ventilator setup? Uh, what are the common settings and variables set up for the patient, such as PEEP, FIO2, respiratory rate, and then tidal volume? We're going to talk about a little bit about the special settings of uh, ventilator strategy in certain conditions, such as COPD and ARDS. So mechanical ventilator is a life support machine. Uh, the purpose of using the life support machines is to help the patient to get through the storm, to buy some time for the patient to recover from the disease process. So for example, if you have a patient with pneumonia and cannot elicit enough oxygenations, so you put the patient on mechanical ventilators to buy time for the patient to recover, to buy time for the antibody to work. So that's the purpose of mechanical ventilators. So make, during the time when the when patient is on mechanical ventilators, machine will take the workload from the patient. So when you talk about like the proportion of how much work done by the machine or how much work done by the patient, you can kind of like separate into different groups. The first group is control breath. So control breath means that patient does not do any work at all, and ventilator does all the work. For patients like, for example, a patient with ARDS and an under neuromuscular blockade, the machine does all the work for the patient. Assist breath is a uh, patient can start the work on its own and the machine will take over the work after that. And this is one of the common modes that we use on the mechanical ventilator, assist control, assist breath. Support breath is meaning that uh, when patient about to get recovered and able to elicit most of the work or some of the work, uh, ventilator are in the rules for assisting the patients, and that is support breath. Commonly, we talk about like pressure support. So again, talking about the mode, um, there are volume control or pressure control, where patient does do any work at all and machine do all the work for the patient. That is volume control or pressure control. Volume assist control and pressure assist control, meaning that a patient can initiate the work on its own, um, but then machine take over after that. And pressure support, I always talk about like pressure support is kind of like an invasive BiPAP or invasive NIV, where a patient can initiate the breath, patient can terminate breath, and what uh, the patient, what machine helps is to give the extra pressure. Uh, so when we talk about what is volume AC or volume assist control or pressure assist control, it's the variable that remains constant. So in volume AC, uh, volume remains constant during the inspiration cycle. And pressure, AC pressure is the constant variable during the inspiration cycle. And let's go through how we communicate with the machine. So there are three different kind of common modes, volume AC, pressure AC, and pressure support. The first thing that machine need to know is that when the human want to initiate the breath. Okay, so that's called trigger. Means that for somehow the human need to trigger the breath and machine detect that signal knowing that patient is initiating the breath and the inspiration cycle begins. So that's the trigger. So how the patient how the machine knows? Well, the machine can detect whether patient make a negative pressure or patient make an uh, inspiration and to reach certain flow, the airflow, so that machine knows, that, wow, that is the human start to take a breath. So that's kind of a, we call trigger. After that, machine detect the patient are 
and starting the breath, then machine start to give the uh, the the volume. I mean, giving the air. During the time for giving the air, they want to know the machine want to know uh, what are the things. How do we give the air? Um, is it something that what variable have to remain constant and what variable can be changed? So, for example, you are talking about pressure assist control, meaning that uh, during the inspiration cycle, when machine is pushing the air to the patient, uh, during the time pressure remain the constant variable. Means at every time during the every seconds during the inspiration cycle, the pressure remain constant. Because the pressure is constant, so the volumes change accordingly. In contrast, volume AC, the flow is the constant variable. Uh, since the flow and the time are all constant, so the volume is constant. So what I mean is that when machine deliver breath, under every breath, the volume is constant. 400, 400, 500, 500. So because the volume is constant, then pressure is the changing variables. Sometimes the pressure can be large, sometimes pressure can be low, but uh, volume is always the same during volume assist control. Finally, the cycle means that how the machine know whether patient is finishing the breath, is terminating the breath. And that's something that you know is more nuanced, but just for you to reference, the volume assist control cycle is uh, cycle in the volume assist control is volume, and cycle in the pressure control assist control is time. But generally, um, as a begin new beginner to learn the mechanical ventilation, you need to know what is volume assist control and pressure assist control. Is the variable that remain constant during the inspiration cycle. So let's go through two examples to see what are the uh, modes um, on those two settings. So you know you see a very complex graph. Um, you know this is a common a screen that you will see on the ventilators. You have a pressure curve, you have flow curve, you have volume curve. To know which mode is this is, um, you just go through what are things are flat. You know so for example, you'll see here the flow is flat. Means that during the inspiration cycle, the flow has been constant at the certain levels. So this is volume AC. Uh, on the bottom graph, you will see the pressure is kind of flat during the inspiration cycle. So this is pressure assist control. So the tips to look at it is to which parameter is constant, which parameter is flat on the curve. Okay, let's talk about some uncommon mode that we sometimes see people using, and I want to give my comments on that. One thing that uh, some RT or you know some physician like use it is SIMV, is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. It looks complex on the words, but basically you can think about it as it's a combo mode of volume uh, volume control and pressure support. Meaning that you have a mandatory number of breath with a set of volume, but you also patient can generate spontaneous breathing. So a lot of people like this mode because this is a mode that you know typically conventionally being used for people who are winning from the ventilators. You know, so you have this volume control you set up for patient to have minimal volume. At the same time, patient can gradually um, have more breath. And have more work, and you know, and that is the PSV, the pressure support part. Uh, generally, medical ICU physicians don't like this mode a lot because it has been shown in some studies that SMV actually can increase cardiac load and doing worse for a patient with cardiogenic shock. And I don't like this mode just because you have this kind of two different mode, and patient will have this kind of irregular respiratory pattern. So during the mandatory breath, it has its own pattern. And doing the spontaneous part, it has its own pattern. So your breathing is not that regular. PRVC is another uh, common popular mode that people like to use. It's pressure regulated volume control. Uh, so the concept is to achieve the set tidal volume at the lowest possible, possible airway pressure. So that means that the machine has a way to detect the pressure and adjust the pressure on the next cycle. So let's put it an example. So what it does is that machine can use the tidal volume as a feedback to regulate the pressure. So for example, if you set up the volume of 500 and you set up a pressure range, so machine, uh, you know, patient take a breath and machine deviate the breath, 
So let's say uh, you know by the patient that taking a breath. Uh, this time, if you set up a five hundred, but patient actually make six hundred. So the next time, the machine will deliver less pressure. So machine will de- you know change the pressure it deliver based on the tidal volume uh, uh, the patient make at the last cycle. So this time I make more ti- uh, patient make more tidal volume, so I will reduce the pressure. Patient make less tidal volume. The next cycle I'm going to give more pressure. So this is kind of like a pressure regulated volume control. Uh, the reason a lot of people like to use that is because it's considered like you know you won't have so much like alarm from the ventilators, and machine will adjust the pressure on its own. Um, and it has been commonly used for like for example, if you have a lot of patients and using pressure um, PRVC, you you know you don't need to get so much alarm so frequently. And it kind of like theoretically provide patient more comfort. The problem for this is that um, it can lead to pressure swing and it can increase the work of breathing in patient who is active. So this is study done in the respiratory medicine case report, um, and you know this is one of the good journal of respiratory medicine, like RT journals. What you see here is that um, during so the left side is pressure control. What you see is that whether a patient is not taking the breath or is actively taking the breath, uh, your pressure uh, requirement from the muscles generating or from the ventilator has been constant. Uh, on the left, right side, you will see a PRVC mode. The PRVC mode, when the passive, you know, when the patient is not taking the breath, you know, everything is constant. But the way, when the machine is, uh, when the patient is active, taking the breath on its own, uh, you will see because there is a pressure swing. And there is a pressure. Um, the machine delivers the pressure at a variables numbers. So, uh, at a summary, a patient have to do more work and increase the work of breathing in patient that on PRVC mode that is active. So, in active patient, there are actually a large proportion of the uh, muscle work um, that required. Uh, I generally. Uh, Okay for using PRVC mode, but for patient with ARDS, for example, there have been study done that showing that PRVC almost over o- always o- overventilate the patients. So I'll be more uh, cautious for patients that require like a very controlled setup. Um, that time I'll probably use pressure AC or volume AC. Okay, so let's talk about the settings. Um, there are Different settings in the machines, and I just include some of the most common things we talk about. There are other things like IE ratio, there's flow rate, and stuff like that. But let me just go through the common variables. Uh, you have four different common variables like FiO2, PEEP, and tidal volume and respiratory rate. Our respiratory function is mainly oxygenations and ventilations. So you know the very simplified way to 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 re- remember that is FiO2 and PEEP is related to oxygen, tidal volume and respiratory rate is related to carbon dioxide. Okay, so let's talk about FiO2. So uh, FiO2 is just meaning that the gas that you provide, how much oxygen are in those uh, the proportion of it. So you can range from twenty one percent in the room air to one hundred percent. Basically, you are p- giving the pure oxygens. Generally, we titrate the FiO2 to, to the target SpO2. Uh, we want to avoid uh, hyperoxia, so we want to avoid giving patient extra oxygen for patients who require oxygenation. Um, there are a lot of reports talking about the hyperoxia, meaning give excessive oxygen that is not necessary, can increase the mortality in stroke, and has no benefit in myocardial infarctions. In healthy patient, when you give so much um, excessive oxygen, you can actually reduce cardiac output by ten to fifteen percent, and it can increase systematic resistance to health volunteer. Why it happens? Because when you give extra oxygen, uh, a very you know a huge amount of oxygen can cause the effect of vessel constrictions. So you can constrict vessels, you can increase the systematic resistance, and that will drop the cardiac output. The other thing that you all know that is free radicals. You give extra oxygen that can generate free radicals, and that can potentially worsen the organ dysfunction and cause more lung injury. 
uh, COPT patient, and you know, uh, I think it's already a general practice that we want to target in the CO, like SPO to 88 to 92 percent. There are a lot of reasons we should not hyperoxygenate patient with a COPD. There are three different uh, theories and mechanisms. I don't really have much time to go through each of them, uh, but generally, we want to target regular patients of SPO2 of 92 to 96 percent. That's generally our set up a range. And COPD patients, I will have a more restricted rule for making the SPO2 range between 88 to 92 percent. So, do we have evidence for you know making the COPD 88 to 92 percent? And we actually have. Um, this is the journal published in Emergency Medicine Journal in 2021, and talking about the range of the SPO2 and how would that affect the mortality in patients with COPD exacerbation. And what you can see, the lowest mortality rate, either patient is normal capnic or hypercapnia. The mortality rate is at lower when somebody is targeting at an SPO2 88 to 92%. Okay, the other thing that can affect the oxygenation besides SPO, like FiO2, is the PEEP. So PEEP uh, is abbreviation of positive and expiratory pressure. So usually the name kind of confuses the concept. Uh, PEEP does not only exist in the end expiratory pressure. Uh, pressure, uh, it's a, it, the division of the PEEP is the pressure in the lung that exceeds above atmospheric pressure. When we apply PEEP, PEEP is not only in the end expiratory phase, it's a constant pressure throughout the ventilator cycles. So here you see uh, a ventilator graph that have a pressure and flow and volume. What you see here is that the pressure loop, look at, uh, focusing on the pressure. So you will see here, there are some gap uh, from zero, and this gap is constantly existing throughout the ventilator cycles. And this is the PEEP. So the PEEP is maintaining constant pressure throughout the uh, inspiratory and expiratory cycles. The purpose of that is to, uh, we tend to have a alveoli collapse at the end of expiration because that's the time that when the pressure is at the lowest point. So that's time the, pressure, the, the alveoli will collapse. So if, and then when you give in the air, the alveoli open again, with this kind of closing, opening, closing, opening, you can actually cause atelic trauma and you can actually cause the injury to the alveoli. So you want to have some way to make sure the alveoli is opening and, and do throughout the respiratory cycles. And that's the function of the PEEP, to open the alveoli to have the constant pressure throughout the ventilator cycles. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this is more like, like a complete graph, uh, is that when areola is on the left side, areola is areola expanding alveoli, it's like that. And you know, during the, at the highest peak, then all the alveoli open. And the middle one is that when a uh, patient is at the end of aspiration, because of the um, because of uh, the negative the pressure is on the lowest point, then some alveoli collapse. But because of the PEEP, some alveoli still opened. Let's say if you don't apply the PEEP, you know, aspiration to zero with no PEEP, and your alveoli collapse. So the process for using PEEP is to prevent alveoli collapse, so that prevent atelectic trauma. You also improve oxygenation because you basically open more alveoli, and uh, you have less collapse, uh, less number of collapsed alveoli. So you're kind of causing a recruitment of closed alveoli. Uh, because you open some, you open the alveoli, you can actually improve the lung compliance. Uh, PEEP it also improves the distribution of ventilations. So the pressure in our lungs, uh, you can get us like an overall number from the ventilators, like your plateau pressure, your peak pressure. But if you um, de like look like into the individual alveoli, each alveoli have a different pressure, opening pressure. Some alveoli have less resistance, some alveoli have large resistance. The opening pressure for each alveoli are different. Uh, once that, so for example, on the left side, you see when the PEEP is zero, uh, it requires three for the upper one to open, and five for the phenomenal one to open, and, five, and eight and 15 and so forth. Uh, if you apply PEEP, uh, because PEEP is eight, for example, 
Then you open the alveoli on the three and open the alveoli on the five, so that become eight. And you also apply the peep. You didn't necessarily open the um, the middle one, but it become ten, and the last one become thirteen. You basically cause a more homogeneous distribution of ventilations and the pressures. So that's the one of the function of the peep. Uh, peep does have some side effect. Uh, when you apply excessive peep that is not needed, you can cause excessive increase of intrathoracic pressure, and that can cause overstretching of the alveoli and cause more risk of bowel trauma. It means that you apply so much peep, so much pressure throughout the inspiratory cycles, so you can potentially uh, causing pneumothorax and causing more bowel trauma. The other thing I want to talk about is how the effect of the PEEP on cardiac output. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, PEEP has a negative effect on the cardiac output. Um, the real answer is, I, I think it depends on the volume status. So how the positive pressure make an impact on hemodynamic effects? Uh, positive pressure while, apply, while applying to the lungs, because it's a positive pressure in the lungs, it does almost always reduce LV and RV preload. So it reduces the venous return because you have so much pressure in the lungs. So it takes harder for the blood to come back to the heart. So you reduce the venous return. You also increase RV afterload because you have pressure in the lungs. So it takes more effort for the right ventricle to squeeze the blood into the lungs. So that uh, it increases RV afterload. The interesting thing is that uh, depends on your volume status. Generally, you can have reduced LV afterload. It basically reduces the pressure gradient uh, between the abdominal aorta and thoracic cavity. This one is hard to really kind of imagine uh, visibly through the through through the imagination, but basically what you can consider is that you have a pressure in the lungs and that kind of like wrapping around the heart, and that's kind of helping. Uh, you no, know, it takes some effort for the heart to pump in the blood into the abdomen. By having the pressure around the heart and in the thoracic cavity, you, you mitigate the pressure gradient between the thoracic part and abdominal part. So you reduce the LV afterload. So since that it reduced LV preload, but also reduced LV afterload, how would that impact the cardiac output depends on your volume stance. So let's say you have a patient with GI bleed, already hypovolemia, so if, and you are like a preload dependent status. So even a little bit peak pressure that can drop your cardiac output because you don't even have enough venous return to begin with. And by applying the PEEP, you reduce further of the venous return. Uh, but, so let's say, for example, you have a patient with heart failure and you have generally like a volume overload. That extra amount of PEEP and that impact on the preload may, not, may actually help in the oxygenation and may not have a limited effect of venous return. Um, it doesn't may have a limited impact on overall cardiac output, and it potentially can increase cardiac output. So uh, that is, you know, how the PEEP will affect hemodynamic profiles is really varied on different patients and depend on their volume status. Oh, sorry. Okay, so how do we find the right PEEP? Because we don't want to uh, provide excessive PEEP. At the same time, we want to make sure we provide enough PEEP to even improve the compliance and improve oxygenations. There are different ways of people doing it, and I think this is a more advanced topic. This is for like a pulmonary critical care fellows or critical care specialties uh, providers to figure out. Uh, there are different ways of to find the right PEEP. Um, we basically want to find the PEEP that is providing the best lung compliance and you know to um, to deliver the lowest pressure as possible but open alveoli as much as possible so we can do peep titration by finding the lowest driving pressure uh, we can do this volume pressure loop to find inflection point um, and there are different like advanced uh, mechanical ventilator can calculate on, on its own uh, I will not elaborate more about like how do we find it. It's more like a, it's more like a respiratory mechanics, but it's just this is how the provider find the right peep. Uh, driving pressure is just meaning that uh, I will elaborate that more in the next lecture. But basically, driving pressure is the difference between the plateau pressure and the peep pressure, and we basically play with the knobs, play with the peep numbers, and to find driving lowest driving pressure as possible. 
you will see some you will see sometimes I'm doing this volume loop curve and to find this lower inflection point and that's the pressure that I want to target on. Uh, if you don't know how to play with this respiratory mechanics, there are also a quick reference that you can refer to. Uh, this is ArsNet table. And ArsNet table have a lot of information how do you select your oxygenation, your ventilation, although you may not have Ars patient, but they have this kind of long protective strategy cheat sheet for you to refer to it. Uh, if you don't really know what kind of you know PEEP uh, to set up, you can refer to this table. This table have a two separate table. One is lower PEEP strategy, one is higher PEEP strategy. Depends on which one you think that is more uh, applied to your patient. But so you can set up, for example, um, you know you intubate the patients. Uh, patient require 50.5 uh, of FiO2, which is 50% FiO2. Potentially, you use a lower PEEP strategy. Uh, you will require a PEEP of 10. If you have a higher PEEP strategy, is 16. So it depends on which strategy you want to use on the patients. Okay, so that's O2. O2 can be uh, primarily optimized with FiO2 and PEEP. Uh, and let's talk about a little bit about CO2. Uh, the PCO2 is directly proportioning to your death space and your, your mini ventilations, the effective mini ventilations. Mini ventilation is tidal volumes uh, times respiratory rate. So you can play with the tidal volume or you can play with the respiratory rate in order to titrate uh, and optimize your CO2, PCO2. Respiratory rate in mechanical ventilation is a set rate on the ventilator that is a minimal breathing rate per minute. So let's say if you set up the rate at 10, that means that machine will make sure the patient had 10, at least 10 times per minute of the uh, inspired uh, breathing cycles. So it's set up for the minimum. So it does not restrict the maximum. So if the patient is above the survey, so let's say you set up the rate of 12, but the patient is breathing at 20, uh, you increase the set rate you know, it's not going to make a difference uh, because patients are already breathing above number. If you change from 10 to 18, patient will still breathing at 20. A patient will, and so there's no point to, to go up on the rate at that point. So let's say you have a patient is breathing on rate of 30 and you are set up 20. Is that make a difference to change the rate to lower the breathing rate? No, because patient is breathing fast on its own. We set up the limited number but we don't set up the maximal number. So with the patient is breathing fast, I think the question is that why is patient breathing fast? Is patient because patient have pain, patient have agitation, the sedation is not optimized, this patient have ventilator dyssynchrony, this patient have fever. It's to deal with the underlying cause. So one of the things I want to talk about is that uh, a lot of time when you have ventilator dyssynchrony or you have see the alarm that is keep peep like keep beeping. The most of the time, the ventilator dyssynchrony is managed by not by adjusting the ventilators. It's, man, it's managed by why this patient have dyssynchrony and how do I optimize the patient's situation that a lot of time is not, many, it's not your setup. It's external factors such as patient is not sedated enough, such as patient have pain and agitation. Uh, in patients with obstructive disease, a fast breathing rate can may lead to air trapping, for example, patients with COPD or asthma. So uh, if you want to slow the breathing rate, uh, the breathing rate down, there's no point to adjust ventilators. You just need to sedate the patient more. Uh, how do you write a good tidal volume? Um, so there are, again, in the R's night table, there is a way to you for you to set up the tidal volume. Generally, we want to set a tidal volume. We don't want to overextend it long. We don't want to give the extra volume that patient doesn't need. So there's a way to calculate uh, the right initial ventilator setting. Uh, it's basically based on the predicted body weight because uh, predicted body weight is based on height. So our lung doesn't grow with uh, we getting more weight, but it does grow when we are taller. So uh, the predicted body weight is based on the gender, and it's based on the height. You calculate the predicted body weight and then you can choose what's the right setting. You can start with eight cc per kick of the predicted body weight. Okay, so um, that's the 
tidal volume. Okay, sorry. I was I like, talking about the respiratory rate, but anyway, I kind of like go a little bit forward. So tidal volume. So tidal volume is the amount of air that moves in and out of lungs with rich respiratory cycles. If you have somebody with low tidal volume, so let's say if you set up the pretty body weight and you do the calculation and you set up the, the, the tidal volume, but if you don't have enough tidal volume, you can increase PCO2 because you don't have enough volume for gas exchange. Large tidal volume can cause risk of volo trauma and barrel trauma. The good start is with the ACC per kick of pretty body weight. So first you acquire patient's height, you calculate the pretty body weight, and you can start with ACC per kick. Uh, pretty body weight again is based on height and gender. Uh, in the ARDS, what you can see in the table is you can do by four to eight cc per kick pretty body weight in order to achieve plateau pressure less than 30. Okay, so the default setting, so let's say if you just intubate somebody with pneumonia, doesn't really have ARDS or other weird mechanic like severe asthma. The default setup, you can set up the P buff five to eight and you adjust based on the titration table. You can start with the FI to a little bit on the higher side, like 60%, 80%, and you can get an ABG 30 minutes after um, after you change the setup, and to titrating the, your PEEP and FIL2 based on your PAO2 in your ABG. The good start for tidal volume is ACC of pretty body weight, and the good setup for like the respiratory is like 16 per minute. And that is reasonable setup for people who just got intubated. And you can get an ABG 30 minutes later, you can adjust your uh, setup accordingly. The special scenario for a ventilator, again, this is a very, uh, this very wide topic that I probably take another one hour to explain. But let's not just talk about COPD and ARDS. So COPD and asthma is considered obstructive disease. It means that it takes more effort for the patient to excel to get rid of the uh, air. Uh, so the goal for those patients is to avoid air trapping. Air trapping means that you want to give patient more time for the all the, uh, all the, uh, the gas exchange to come out. So you want to prolong exhale phase, and you want to um, uh, you want to limit the inspiratory phase. So there are different ways of doing that. Um, generally, if your patient is breathing very fast, then patient lose the time for exhale. So you want to slow the respiratory rate and you can do that by sedation. You can also uh, have to uh, prolong the expirated time. So to, met, to, to uh, manipulate that is to go up on the flow rate, it means that you give the volume faster, so you generally have relative more time for the patient to e exhale. So more E time and less I time. You also want to avoid large tidal volume because if you have large tidal volume and patient is breathing fast, you can cause air trapping. So for those patients, it's very important to focus on the pH, not the PCO2, and you can have permissive hypercapia. And the goal is to sedating the patient to achieve ventilatory synchrony. Uh, ARDS have a different goal. The ARDS meaning the lung compliance is stiff, so you want to reduce ventilator-associated lung injury. Uh, generally, we'll talk about that more in the ARDS management. Uh, but long protective strategy including low tidal volume, ventilation, high respiratory rate, and PEEP titration, and permiss hypercarbia. And those are the things that we'll talk about more uh, in the next lectures. Uh, thanks for your attention today.